The fact that we're working within three war-torn countries, uh, it's the first. It's kind of for me, it's because it's about to disappear. The tradition, in fact, is, um, you know, the, the, the tissue of culture, of identity. Somewhere, someone has to make a start. And I think the start is always the toughest. In September 2004, four musicians from Brazil, Portugal and Angola met in Luanda to undertake a unique musical journey in Southern Africa. I've come to Luanda to meet a man named Kitushi. He's said to be the greatest player of the ungo, a traditional single-string bow whose roots run far into this tragic country's past. Ben is a young journalist who has agreed to help me find Kitushi and more about this intriguing musical heritage. Mas é só uma informação, sabe onde é que vive o mais velho Kitushi? Aquele músico. Ele é músico, toca. Não sabe. Luanda is not an easy place to get around. It's barely two years since the war ended, a war that crushed this nation during almost 30 years of brutal struggle. There are nine million people in this city, and they all seem to be heading for the same place at the same time. Further out in the suburbs, the traffic starts to ease, but there are no street signs, and Ben resorts to more traditional ways of trying to find Kitushi. Como é fixe? Obrigado. É para vocês saber onde é que vive o mais velho Kitushi, aquele que toca, aquele músico. Obrigado, senhor. Ah, oui. O primeiro que está azul. Então, faixa, vou dizer só uma coisa. Sabe onde é que vive o mais velho Kitushi? Do you know where can I find Kitushi? We eventually locate Kitushi's house down a potholed, dusty street in deep suburbia. These neighborhoods are still recovering from the trauma of the recent past, with water just being one of the things that no one takes for granted. It's a sweltering afternoon, and in the shade of a very small tree, we wait for Kitushi. Eventually, he arrives, unassuming, a little stern, and with a stride that takes sway of the streets. So, this is Kitushi, the master of the ungo and the gatekeeper of a musical tradition that goes back thousands of years. Kitushi's scrapbook bursts with the memories of his groups and the journeys they traveled. Groups that Angolans spoke of with pride, like Fetisho Negro and Conjunto Musico Teatral Ngongo. These musicians played their time-honored sounds and songs to audiences in Sweden and Colombia, Brazil and Cuba, and even in the former USSR. These days, Kitushi's life is quieter, and his cherished ungo sits in the corner of his living room unplayed. But today, he's dusting it off in preparation for an important musical journey that he'll soon be embarking on. Lá, nós aqui chamamos de ungo. O nome que nós conhecemos aqui, com aquilo. Okay. Portanto, é um instrumento que é, é muito frequente, é tocado, portanto, tocavam agora, quer dizer, está quase na via de extinção. Sim. Portanto, a ilha de Luanda tocavam. Okay. Ali, tem aquele toda a província do Bengo, uhum. não é? Mundo... A Barra do Dando. Então, um instrumento que era muito usado. Era portanto, muito usado. Lá. Okay. Hoje, se formos para lá, Porque é saber o jovem lá quase que não conhece. Não conhece, já portanto, é Aqui na região de Luanda, era eu, portanto, sou o único portanto, que tocava isso. Agora que os jovens estão a ganhar gosto. Exatamente, sim. Com que começaram agora a aparecer grupos, portanto, idênticos. In the city of Durban, South Africa, musician and concert organizer Dan Kiorboli surveys this inner city park, the site of this year's Awesome Africa Music Festival. The end of apartheid in South Africa opened many doors previously closed to musicians and music promoters. For several years now, Dan has been setting up musical collaborations with musicians around the world to play at the Awesome Africa Festival. 
We've been cut off from the mainstream for so long, we're still trying to rediscover our roots. So in a sense, we trying to go back to find out where our roots came from. As a percussionist, I uh, get involved with the things that I feel closer to me musically, that I connect with. And, and the origins basically came from the fact that there's always been a direct link um, with the bow through Angola into West Africa and through to Brazil. And then especially going up towards Mozambique, flowing through um, South Africa, in particular the Trans Sky. But the origins were always in Angola. Back in Angola, it's these origins that Kitushi is keeping alive in spite of the isolating effect of 30 years of war and a music industry that has long since succumbed to narrow commercial constraints. Um instrumento musical quando levar a caixa de ressonância. Porque eu na Hungria, Sim. com aquele traje de pele que eu tinha na outra hora, Sim. ao descer do autocarro com o Hungo, ao meter o pau para fazer isso o pau, todo mundo fugiram. Eu vou explicar isso. Ele está a captar o som. Eu vou fugir de maneira. Então, na mão direita temos a vara para ver os traios do The modest house soon fills with the evocative sounds of this ancient instrument. It's a sound that has been familiar in households here for hundreds of years. The earliest known sign of the bow being used as a musical instrument is from a cave painting in France that dates back 15,000 BC. It is thought, however, that bows were played in Africa way before that. The influence of this instrument has been felt in many parts of the world and tracing some of these strands is what Dan Kiorbali is trying to do. On the way back to town, I can't help but wonder about the future of this beautiful but tortured country. When asked if this is my first time in Angola, I say yes. I find it awkward to admit that in fact, I've been to the country many times during the 80s and early 90s while working for an international news agency. It was always with the UNITA rebels and I had the opportunity to see firsthand how the USA and the old South African regime had propped up an illegitimate army led by the increasingly demented Jonas Savimbi. I also saw how their desperation drove them to conscripting younger and younger boys into this army. In the process, destroying homes and families, and the very fibre of rural society. But now the streets of Luanda are full of images of a country hauling itself up from the ruins of its recent past. Shops and markets are opening up, the oil fields and diamond mines are in full production, and the multinationals are back in town. One can literally buy anything on the streets, from electrical appliances to cold bottled water, and from clothing to digital cameras. Many parts of the city still show signs of the war and there is a seeming reluctance to preserve the vestiges of colonial times in favour of new buildings of steel and glass. But still, there are reminders everywhere of past glories built at the expense of the subdued majority. While a handful of hotels are back in operation, the city still struggles to provide its citizens with basic facilities. Despite the apparent chaos, the feeling on the streets is friendly and unthreatening. That is, until we produce the camera. There seem to be an endless number of armed men in uniform and we are constantly being told to stop filming. Even the hawkers are suspicious of cameras. The following day, Kitushi heads off to the home of Innocenzio Gonzalvez. Innocenzio has been a member of Kitushi's group since the 60s and will be traveling with Kitushi for the shows that lie ahead. Innocenzio is not home, but Kitushi pulls these prized instruments from storage and starts warming up. 
Innocenzio's extended family gathers round and Katushi has no trouble getting the younger generation to help with the rhythm. Many of these instruments appear to be rudimentary and easy to play, but the techniques and skill used to make them come alive have been passed down for generations. The sounds are infectious, and before long, the small courtyard is buzzing with these songs that are so deeply rooted in Angola's history. <laughs> also clearly cuts through the age barrier as the whole family get into the groove. It's a hot and humid afternoon and Kitushi suggests that we cool off with a taste of the local beer. As one thing inevitably leads to another, it's not long before the party starts getting a little rowdy. Neighbours drop in attracted by the music. And even this traveling bra and panty salesman arrives to try and make a sale. The roots of many of the rhythms of Latin America are to be found right here in Angola. And Kitushi seamlessly makes the shift from the traditional to the modern. Ilia de Luanda is a peninsula that forms the bay and overlooks the city. In his heyday, this is where Katushi and his group reigned supreme at the clubs and venues that once packed this waterfront playground. The harbour is slowly getting busier and small-scale fishermen find a ready market as restaurants reopen. But it's also the music that is slowly making its way back into daily life. <laughs> É aquele, portanto, que a mim me toca mais. Portanto, somos nós o fazedor dessa tal música e que depois é transportada para o palco, né? Saindo das sanzalas ou dos quimbos para o palco, onde sofre, portanto, aquela, é, aquela, aquele preparo de estilização, porque ela sai de um instrumento rústico para os instrumentos modernos, que são as violas, que são órgãos, instrumentos de sopro, não sei quantos mais. Portanto, para nós mesmo, para qualquer povo, a música tradicional, que é a música de raiz, é aquela mesmo que é feita para qualquer povo. As the sun sets, the city puts on a different face. Streets that were not long ago shrouded in curfews and darkness are now buzzing with activity. I find I can walk safely around the city and soon discover a few places to get a good meal. This glitzy new hotel sits slightly uncomfortably beside one of the poorer areas of the city and the rich and poor eye each other through huge plate glass windows. It's a gap that just never seems to close. The following morning, Ben arrives to pick up Kitushi. The other musicians in this project will be flying in later from Brazil and Portugal, and Kitushi needs to inspect the theatre, where they'll be performing over the weekend. The Teatro Nacional has been closed for many years, and for the past few weeks, artisans have been hard at work preparing this wonderful and historic theatre to its former splendour. It soon becomes evident that while the stage and auditorium may be ready for the concert, the sound system belongs to a bygone age. But this is Luanda, and such things are clearly few and far between. There's not much that Kitushi can do, except wait for the others to arrive. Back in Durban, Dan is trying to deal with these and many more problems that keep cropping up, but it is clearly not easy. We've got to start somewhere. In a sense, we're pioneers. In a sense, 
what comes in the next 10 years and the next 20 years is where the benefit really lies. But somewhere, someone has to make a start. And I think the start is always the toughest angle to take. And that's where we are right now. I think um, in a nutshell, yeah, it does. Through all the hardships, through all the concerns, traveling through the countries, I think fundamentally the music comes through. And the fact that we're working within three war-torn countries, uh, it's the first. It's never been done before, so let's, let's take that as we won down, from now we can really start making things work. And, and the contacts that have been made within the three countries as well, those you know, people that have never spoken to each other before in their lives are now slowly beginning to develop a circuit. And the important thing now is to carry it through. This is Nana Vasconcelos and his manager Capucho. Nana is widely regarded as Brazil's greatest living percussionist. This distinction, however, meant little to the authorities and, like the rest of us, had to spend the best part of two hours getting through customs. These boxes are filled with the tools of Nana's trade, weird and wonderful instruments often made by the maestro himself. After dropping them at the hotel, Ben and I go to meet Victor Gama, who arrived late the previous evening. Victor grew up in Angola but left in his late teens to avoid conscription into an army fighting an increasingly protracted war. He now lives in Portugal where he makes and plays instruments that often defy musical conventions and take up a lot of space in the bus. While he no longer lives here, Victor still sees Luanda as his home and is clearly delighted at the prospect of playing in his old hometown. Down at the Teatro Nacional, the four musicians finally meet up. Victor and Ketushi have worked together before, but for the rest of them, this is their first meeting. And incredibly, the following evening, they'll all be together on the same stage. As the four of them start unpacking their instruments, it becomes clear that this collaboration is going to stretch the imagination of even the most ardent music fan. The stage starts filling up with strange shapes and sounds. It is the bow that instantly dominates proceedings. In Brazil it's known as the Berimbau, but it's a direct derivation of the Ungo, which was brought to Brazil by Angolan slaves. This is the first time that Nana and Katushi have played together and the bond is instant and undeniable. The sound system is clearly a problem, but Ben has found someone who might be able to help, and negotiations are underway. Victor calls this instrument the spider. It's what emerged when he had the idea of turning the bow into a multi-stringed polyphonic instrument. As this cultivated and talented intellectual tunes his extraordinary instruments, the chaotic sounds of the street outside seep through the building. The theatre is in the centre of town, and walking around here, one is constantly bombarded by images of despair and poverty. Amputees from the war are a common sight on the streets. This war veteran lost two limbs defending his country and now begs at a taxi stop. While the state may have forgotten his contribution to society, it doesn't mean that the man or woman on the street has. I hear stories of massive government corruption and ask Victor if the socialist experiment has failed the people. Which was in fact an experiment, but it, wasn't, it was the only uh, way to go uh, at that time to stop uh, the invasion of uh, the South African SADC and, um, and to give a, a sense of structure 
to the Angolan society. That structure still remains today, but there is just a, a pointed, pointing finger always to uh, uh, you know, the small African states, the very new African states, and I don't think in a way it's fair. But there is corruption and you know, it has to be tackled. And I think um, things are improving. Uh, there are signs that things are improving. One of the signs that things are improving is that despite the obstacles, this concert looks like it's going to happen. A functional sound system has been located and in the short time they've been together, the four musicians have created a basic musical structure to work on. Much of it will be improvised, but the traditional roots of the music seem to be what hold the whole program together. Tradition, in fact, is um, you know the, the the tissue of culture of identity. You know, it's it's what uh, uh, what sh what what keeps uh, the memory of uh, of the people. Um, and it's very intricate and varied. I learn a lot uh, from traditional music from Angola now by listening to Tushi in a sense. You know. And uh, this is, is important because uh, those, those kind of things, this kind of music is, is about to disappear with no resistor. And by doing those kind of projects, keep that cultural, those roots. Alive. To keep uh, tradition, traditions and, and uh, traditional music alive is very important to renovate the cycle of creativity, uh, to uh, be able to draw from, from the knowledge, from the past experiences and project into the future. The change room is stark and stuffy as the musicians wait to see if they have an audience. Outside, Colin Miller from the Swiss Arts Council, Pro Helvetia, also waits to see who will turn up for the show. Pro Helvetia are co-sponsors of the project, and it was through Colin's intervention that the sound system was paid for, saving the concert from certain disaster. Are you amazed that it's actually yeah. going to happen? I, um, no, I never doubted that it would happen. I was confident, uh, and I, I think Victor Gama kind of kept me optimistic when he reminded me that, you know, that's how things unfold here. Uh, it's difficult, but at the end of the day, the gig happens, the people come, and the musicians play. Hello. As the audience arrive, Nana does a last-minute interview with Radio Angola. And then it's showtime.
Amazingly, the concert has gone off without a hitch. The musicians seem tired but happy. The audience overjoyed. And I'm left wondering about the role music plays in healing a war-torn nation. I don't know uh, much about <laughs> healing therapies and stuff like that. Um, you know, there are many ways in which uh, people uh, get over uh, the traumas. But I think it definitely plays a role in uh, bringing people together because music brings people together. A música anda que caminha com o homem ter nas na, nas suas nas suas tristezas nas suas alegrias, né? Tivemos ali, ali tristezas, né? tivemos tristezas no tempo em que estivemos em guerra. Hoje estamos em paz. As nossas mensagens são diretas, portanto, com, com músicas, portanto, aquelas canções, essas mensagens para que o povo, portanto, levamos, portanto, esqueçam o passado e vivam alegria. É isso. The changes that South Africa has come through over the past 10 years start becoming evident as one arrives at Joburg International Airport. For one thing, we can safely use our cameras without the risk of being arrested. In the transit lounge on our way to Mozambique, you can buy anything from exotic booze to diamonds. I couldn't help speculating about the source of these diamonds. It was the struggle for control of Angola's rich mineral resources that helped to incite and intensify the war that destroyed Kitushi's homeland. But for these old cultural warriors, their next encounter will be on the concert stage in the thriving city of Maputo. The group finally arrives tired and irritated at the hotel in Maputo. For no apparent reason, the customs officials have seized all the musical instruments and locked them up in a storeroom at the airport. Luckily for me, I've been through this before and managed to get our camera gear through relatively easily. The following morning, it's back to the airport to try and get the instruments released. Amazingly, no one seems to notice the video camera in my hand, so I decide to just let it roll. Inside is total confusion, as one group of officials blame another, saying they don't know what they're doing. I wonder what it is about a uniform that turns normal people into fatuous, overbearing bullies. Of all the people on the flight, these musicians were arguably given the worst treatment by the customs officials. I've always thought that musicians made the world a better and not a more dangerous place. To make matters worse, a large hole has been knocked into one of Victor's flight cases. At the Brazilian Cultural Center in downtown Maputo, he examines the damage more closely. Fortunately, everything is intact and ready for the next concert. These uh, calabasas are so, so strong that they take all the pressure. Mm. They take all the pressure from the strings here and then here as well. You see the, this round form, this spherical form, is really tough. About 15 years ago, I was in Maputo working on a news story. The city was ravaged by more than a decade and a half of war. There were no shops, no food, no running water. To see this great city today is close to miraculous. The streets are clean, the markets overflow with every shape and color of fruit and vegetable. The fishing industry, while still plagued by foreign poachers, is gaining strength, feeding and employing millions of Mozambicans. As night falls, it's hard to imagine the hardships that these residents once endured, as bars and restaurants fill with people and music flows out onto the busy streets. At the Brazilian Cultural Center, Nana is due to host a workshop that is to be attended by a group of young local musicians. Only a handful have arrived as they start showing the old master their own skills and traditions.
As the sound of Nana's berimbau drifts through the halls and galleries of the building, others arrive, including teachers, aid workers and diplomats. Nana slowly draws them in, creating a rhythmic pattern for which she steadily builds cross rhythms and melodies. As the beat gains momentum, the crowd gets bigger and more enthusiastic. Even if some of them do struggle to keep up the beat. With nothing but hands, feet and voices, this master of improvisational percussion leads his ensemble into a crescendo of rhythmic rapture. Recently, there's been a new interest in this Brazilian martial art known as capoeira. It is traditionally performed with the berimbau, giving the instrument a new lifeline. It's very important to don't forget the organic side of meals, the organic, the roots. This is very important. That way you can mix uh, that's, that's information and uh, I think the traditional music can help you a lot to deal with technology because in fact the technology imitates the organic things. Tonight's concert is to be held at the French Cultural Institute's semi-open-air theatre in the heart of the city. The facilities here compare with the best in the world, and in no time at all, they are ready for the gig. Maputo is now firmly on the international cultural map, and is a regular stopover for many of the world's top artists. That evening, looking out over the flourishing Maputo Bay, I wonder where Victor's hopes and dreams lie as his own country starts the long haul back to peace and stability. Whatever the answer, it's now time to get ready for the show. The theatre is housed in a complex that includes a bar, restaurant and art gallery. But tonight, it's the magic of the strings of the bow that pack them in.
almost on cue, the entire city is plunged into darkness. The ecstatic crowd slowly filters out into the night, with only the moon and the passing headlights to guide them. The next evening we arrive in Durban. Once through customs, it soon becomes clear that we have a new problem. There is no sign of Katushio in the Senzio, and we can't get back into the customs hall to find out what is going on. Eventually, Dan finds out they are being held for not having the correct visas. After two hours of tough talking, they agree to release them after paying a fine. It's going through, can you add a minute? Basically, we're going to pay a fine of 800 rand each to get them out of... Uh get them out of immigration, which is a fine, but uh, I pay that under duress. After several more hours and dozens of forms filled out in triplicate, Kitushi and Innocenzio are released. It was an extremely close shave. When Dan arrived to pay the fine, they were about to be put on the plane back to Maputo, all the result of an official hardening of attitudes towards immigrants from neighboring countries. In this, the much vaunted 10th year of South Africa's democracy, the city of Durban shows all signs of growth and prosperity. The informal sector trades freely downtown, and the port is busy with a constant flow of imports and exports. The yacht basin is packed with vessels both local and international. Democracy has brought a new sense of security to this once troubled country, but as the new flag flies over the monuments of its colonial past, in the streets, it's no longer only the black population who are poor. Like in Angola and Mozambique, it's a gap that just never seems to close. A mere 15 minutes from these luxurious mansions tucked behind their security walls, these residents live in hope of one day having the most basic of facilities. Nonetheless, conditions are slowly improving and the Awesome Africa Festival is part of one of the city's urban renewal programs. The festival itself celebrates a diversity of musical styles and cultures. traditional form known as Burumusik and once regarded as the music of the oppressor in South Africa makes a welcome appearance. Along with the performances, the festival also hosts community outreach programs and workshops, one of which is hosted by Kitushi and Innocenzio. These workshops attract a diverse range of young artists and over the years have seen many cultural bridges being built. In 
Nana happily joins in with Kitushi and Innocenzio. It's clear that they've learned a lot from each other over the past week. I think it was fantastic because uh, the main thing is the music. And uh, by meeting Innocenzio and Master Kitushi, for me it was a great experience because uh, they came from Angola. And Angola is a very important place for Brazil. A lot of things come from Angola to Brazil. Ungo is the father of the Birimbau, we can say like that. It has the same instrument, but uh, they arrived from Angola to there. By having uh, one artist doing contemporary stuff, uh, linked to traditional stuff, uh, it's like showing a different approach to people, and, and, uh, and they appreciate that, and, and they start in a way, actually being interested about the traditional forms that uh, they don't know here, but are there in the countryside, you know, south, north, east, west. Uh, there are many forms of, of uh, uh, traditional music and, tra and traditional arts, culture, um, that in fact also has contemporary variants, because there are artists in the rural areas who are doing new things. Uh, so. It's not that tradi traditional is, is, you know, static, but it has, uh, especially in, in Africa, I think, uh, this, the traditions move a lot. The weather hasn't been kind to the festival goers, and by the time they play, the wind has begun howling across the stage. But it's not enough to keep them from a last great performance. That's it. Despite the problems and obstacles that landed readily in the way, they have managed to complete a collaborative musical journey that has never before been attempted, which has connected traditions across continents and linked the past with the present. Has it been worth the effort? Tough, really tough. A um, lot of immigration problems, a lot of customs problems. Um, the fact that um, the immigration people in all three countries weren't quite up to speed with exactly what the laws were. The laws kept getting, uh, the rules kept getting changed. Nobody quite knew where musicians and transit stood. Um, it, it was tough, it was tough. But I think one of the reasons why we do something like this is the reason why we got into music in the first place and that's that 30 seconds of of emotion that sticks for you sticks with you for a lifetime and to go through and to go through two weeks of really hard living to find that 30 seconds of pleasure that intense pleasure that motivates you and and enriches you and enlightens you to try and keep moving that's that's i think the uh, how the how the whole thing really comes out it's fantastic from, to, to be in a festival like that. I think it's very important. And I tried to listen as I can, everything to, to really you know, learn. And, and, and this um, helped me a lot and helped my intellect. <laughs> Viva Kitushi! Viva Innocencio! E viva Virtu Gama! <laughs>
And viva to this ancient instrument, which has soothed and entertained for thousands of years. From its origins as an instrument of survival, through its growth into a weapon of war, and now the source of music that maintains a precious link with the past. It's an instrument that balances precariously in a world where traditions decay with hardly a trace. It's an instrument that might have already vanished were it not for the efforts of these guardians of the bow.